Well, thank you, Mary, uh, and thank you, Andrew and Bridget, for sharing. Um, we got four weeks to hang out still. I'm gonna miss you guys. And, uh, and I'm thankful that you are um, following what God is asking you to do. This morning, uh, I wanna start by simply going off a little bit off script. Um, Today is God's work, our hands. Someone asked me why I'm wearing this yellow t-shirt. Um, it's something that in the Lutheran tradition we often do is serve our community on a specific day. We do it all year round, but on a specific day every year, uh, we intentionally spend time serving our neighborhood, our, 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 our campus, ways that, and this campus is used locally and globally uh, all the time, so we are thankful that we get to do that today. But let me um, share some hints, some openings, uh, some thoughts about today's scripture. Uh, I don't want to be too long about this because uh, we have to get to do other stuff today. But let me just say this. There was a, if you read the scripture, which you have in front of you, there was a certain rich man uh, who was wearing purple and fine linen who feasted uh, luxuriously every day. But things to notice about this passage is that this rich man has no name. This rich man is wearing purple linen, which uh, Roman law would say only those who are um, able to do that or uh, approved to do that can do that. You had to be pretty special to wear fine linen that was purple. It was an expensive dye. So this rich man was just not an ordinary rich man. I would say to you, this was a very special, well-respected individual. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs and fe that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. Second character, Lazarus. Now, it's interesting to think about this, that in all of Jesus' parables, uh, a name is never given, except here. This parable, Jesus gives the character a name, Lazarus. Now, you may have heard of Lazarus as the one that is the brother of Mary and Martha, the one that was raised back to life by Jesus. But I want you to think of this Lazarus, the one that's begging for food, the one that is, has dogs licking his sores. I want you to think of that Lazarus. Now, this poor man was carried by um, angels to Abraham's side. Now, we'll come back to that in a bit. The rich man also died and was buried. What do we notice? Lazarus dies and is carried off by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man dies and just buried. Two different ways, right, of dying. While being tormented in this place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. At his side, if you read that in other passages, it's with uh, Lazarus at the bosom of Abraham, like a baby at the bosom of his mother, of her mother, just like that. Think of it that way. And not just at his side, but at Abraham's bosom, at his chest, right? He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevice has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot, and neither can anyone cross from there to us. Let's stop here. Do you notice the way they are addressing each other? The rich man addresses Abraham as Father Abraham. Now, if you know anything about the Jewish uh, kind of Torah and the, and, the, and the Jewish tradition and the Hebrew tradition, you know that Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Remember that child uh, him, right? So this is the understanding, right? The rich man looks at Abraham as father, almost like a God type in this story. And did you notice how Abraham addressed the rich man? Child. 
right? Now, what's fascinating also about this piece of uh, uh, these two verses here is how the rich man is now in agony, but still asking for something, still saying, can you send Lazarus to do this? Can you send Lazarus to do that? Now, the rich man, let's keep reading, said, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so that they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. And the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses or the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Now, this is an interesting passage because traditionally there's two landings that I could preach to you, and most would preach this. They would preach from the perspective of the rich man and say, if you're rich, or I would say to you in 2022, if you have disposable income, if you are wealthy, if you have possessions, the thing you must do is feed the hungry, give money to the poor, and then you are clear and don't have to endure the things that this rich man is enduring. The other way to preach to you is from a poor person's perspective, that I would say to you, if you don't have any, if you are poor, if you don't have any means or any possessions or anything like that, then hold on because one day you will receive your reward in heaven. Okay? But I think those two landings would miss a very important teaching here this morning. I think it would miss the point of relationship. There is relationship between the rich and the poor. But let me bring it even closer to us. There is relationship between us and our neighbor, the neighbor that is not like us. That's one relationship. The second relationship is relationship with the creator. And clearly, this man here had a second opportunity to repair those relationships. But what does he do? He's still asking, can you send Lazarus to do this thing for me? Can you send Lazarus to tell my brothers? Can you tell Lazarus to bring me water? He had an opportunity to fix and repair his relationship with Lazarus, even in agony, and still decided not to do so. Now, I think that many of us might consider this to be something about salvation. But I think it's not so much about salvation or being saved. It's not so much about that. It's not about life after death and guaranteeing your ticket to heaven. Rather, I think it's about life before death. And how do we repair relationship with the neighbor who is not like us? How do we repair relationship with the Creator? How do we repair relationship with money? Because ultimately... This man's barrier between neighbor, between the divine, seems to be his riches, seems to be his money, seems to be his possessions. He ate lavishly every night. There's not a feast once a year, not twice a year, but every day, right? And usually the way it's preached is by using threats. If you don't love the poor, if you don't love your neighbor, then you might end up in agony perpetually. You see the threat. If you don't love God, then in, you will end up in perpetual pain and suffering. But clearly threats hasn't worked. <laughs> clearly threats is not the way to go about this passage. But I would say to you, many could preach that this morning. But the repair that I believe needs to happen for us is love. Love. Because people aren't interested in being saved. People are interested in being loved. God does not want your religious duties. God wants your heart. God wants your life. And this rich man could not see Lazarus as his equal, as his neighbor, could not see God as the 
ultimate thing to, or, or, or ultimate being to emulate. He could not see those things. And there lies, perhaps, the wisdom of this morning. That somehow, willingly or unwillingly, things and possessions, riches, and whatever else you want to put in there, somehow become more and above the divine. And therefore, injustice so easily can live and thrive and grow and expand because we continue to put things above humans, things above the divine. We see it in the broken systems here in America. We see it in the broken systems in Christianity, how in both America and Christianity or American Christianity, you see the embeddedness of these ills and sins that are historical, white supremacy, racism, uh, you know, genocide, stealing of lands. You know, that's what historians would say. By all accounts, it was genocide over the indigenous peoples. But we also see the overthrowing here, right, of monarchies. We see here also in our country, in our history, the enslaving and lynching and still murdering of black bodies the abusing and exploiting of immigrants by which most account those immigrants are from the Americas. And so to tell them to leave the Americas is to tell them to leave their lands. And not just that, but the continued flat-out hate and discrimination against the LGBT community. Over and over, the attempt to erase the image of God on each of these person's faces. But I want to say this this morning. Here in this church, here in this space, we are attempting to repair that. We are attempting to repair that. And when we participate in God's work, our hands, in today's work, it is just another attempt to repair that relationship with neighbor and with creator. When you uh, go out into the world and you volunteer, you donate, you support an organization that is doing the work of repairing, or shall we say healing the world, you are participating in this repairing of the world. And I think we have to remember that these communities, these things in this world that are so hard to deal with, uh, you know, specifically the peoples, though, the peoples are not the evil. It's racism, it's things that, like that, the evils of this world, diseases, poverty, homophobia, hate. Those are the evils, and those evils can be alleviated. Guess by who? Because God didn't create these things. Humans created these things. And if humans created these things, then humans should live to attempt to repair those things. And that right there is the liberation. That right there is the Jesus dying on a cross to say to us, you are free, liberated, to go out into this world to repair such things. Begin to love the neighbor that is not like you. Begin to know their name, right? If there's anything from this parable, is know the name of your poor neighbor. You begin to repair your relationship with neighbor. You begin to repair your relationship with the creator. That is the liberating power of the cross that is given to us this morning. Life before death. Life before death. Word of God and word of life. And we all say, thanks be to God.